Our society remains unequal and unbalanced. Black people are 10 times more likely to be stopped by the police than white people. White British students are three times more likely to have a higher grade at A-level than black British Caribbean students. Unemployment for black people is high and the wages are lower. The task of turning this all around is going to take more than a talk. The first thing we have to do to make an immediate difference for people from marginalised groups is to give them a greater role in shaping the services and also designing the solutions for their local problems. I am asking you what you are willing to surrender in order for there to be change. A more equitable society is one that will not ask marginalised communities to play by rules that they do not understand. To participate fully in society, we must all be allowed to be heard, met at our point of need, and allowed to participate fully in not just designing the rules and not just being made to follow them. So we need three things. We need understanding. Understanding the self-esteem of a community whose daily experience is stop and search. Voice. Giving people a voice so as to alleviate feelings of being dismissed and ignored. Participation. What does it take for a disempowered black community to be involved in a weapon sweep involving local police officers, their local civic leadership and ward councillors? Being seen as part of the solution and not just the problem. This is the starting point for all of us to understand that to resolve these issues is going to take sharing and surrender. Meeting the community at its point of need. Let me tell you about my community. I have come here this afternoon from the sunny shores of Thornton Heath, which is in the borough of Croydon, which is in South London. I believe where I live is the most diverse place in my borough, and I think it's evidenced by the many businesses and shops that line our high street. My family have lived there since the 1960s, and I'm very proud of where I come from, my ends. And yet we have had our challenges. Between 2015 and 2017, we saw an increase in youth violence involving local young people around the knife crime theme. Locally and regionally, the focus was on placing interventions around the young person. But I could see that there was no voice, no understanding, no participation given to the wider community around this theme. What about the adults that were caught up in this context? The family members, the parents, the adults that were working in the youth interventions? Where were the politicians who had community safety as their portfolios and education and young people? And where were the police officers? So I decided to create a space where we could all meet. The traditional approach or solution when something like this happens typically in a community is for people to come in and to tell you how you feel rather than to ask you how you feel. And this is something I wanted to avoid completely. By combining understanding, understanding that we needed to hear the voices of local people, and by giving people direct participation, we saw change. Self-esteem began to grow. And more importantly, solutions emerged. But why is this approach needed? What is not working with the top-down approach that we currently work to in society? After all, everybody in this room knows how well-intentioned government workers and public service staff are. They're such bright and well-meaning individuals. But what about those communities whose primary nurturing environment is one beset by trauma and discrimination? Will they have the chance of exhibiting the organic self-confidence that people from more privileged backgrounds do? Dr. Vicky Mays from UCLA points to decades of research that highlight that those people who have been treated differently and unfairly in their lives run the risk of having 
more stress disorders such as depression and anxiety. Writing about the African-American experience, Amber Johnson speaks to a lifetime of racist experiences and how that's correlated to internalised shame. And none of this is new. Akala, Satnampuri, no, that's not wrong, Samir Puri, Satnam Sangira have all documented in their writing the experiences of those who were in power during the long days of empire. And still, how that timeline casts such a shadow over race relations and equality and diversity in Great Britain. But some of you will say, oh, but Donna, things have progressed. Things have moved along. And some things have. The Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparity report that was published earlier on this year, yes, that report, pointed to educational successes for those who are part of ethnic groups, factoring in socioeconomic factors. And the report went on to say that these findings should be celebrated, replicated, and used as an example for students across the UK. But do you remember at the beginning of my talk, the statistics that I mentioned around stop and search, around school, around pay, around jobs? Those point to structures that are still failing to deliver. Let's use as an example the Metropolitan Police Force. Currently, the Met is involved in a recruitment drive to increase the number of officers or intake of new recruits from the black, Asian and minority ethnic uh, communities. This is a bold move by the Met, given its decades uh, tense relation, of ten tense relationships with the black community around areas of policing. This is definitely about the Met bringing in, through its lower ranks, a more diverse workforce. And yet this same organisation, at the chief officer, senior management level, has minimal black representation. The level at which real change could be made and help the same organisation communicate better with the communities that it serves. So this is not about recruitment. This is about the long-held failure to alter the culture that those new recruits will be accommodated by. Is this because there's a lack of understanding within the Met? What about the voices? Are they listening to the voices where they need to be heard within the organisation? And what about participation? Is it participating directly in solving its own problems? But let's not just point at the Met. Where are the head teachers, the social workers, the housing officers, the prison officers, the welfare officers? They too must ask themselves the same question. Without a doubt, part of this process will be to surrender the power that you possess so that other people can have a more equitable life. But I have seen what surrender can do. Back in Thornton Heath, we invited local politicians, um, heads of government departments, senior police officers locally, to come and meet local people and listen to how they were failing those same people. But from this came a level of engagement. Three things came out of this that I wish to share with you this afternoon. One was about relationships. We invited senior leaders to surrender their hierarchy to meet local people at their point of need to meet and discuss about the local problems as peers. The trust, both sides had to surrender the belief that either one of them had the, the, the solutions to our problems locally. And commitment to participation. This wasn't about just coming, it wasn't tick box, people didn't just come and they left. This was a committed journey for all of us and from it, were born really good initiatives that still support the communities in Croydon to this day. This is how you truly meet a community at its point of need. Yes, the situation looks hopeless, but I am convinced through my work that the only way for us to make society more equal is to understand that there needs to be a transference of power. 
please remember that this is not us asking for an equal share of resources. This is asking for an equal voice in designing the solutions to our problems. To have active participation in creating the systems that will support us. By listening to people, understanding their experiences, we begin to build a more inclusive and successful solutions and society. The question is, what and how much are you willing to surrender so that others can have a more fulfilled life? What will your call to action be around inequality? Will you treat the thought of surrender as a dream deferred, something to be pushed behind? In the words of the great Langston Hughes, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and run? Or does it stink like rotten meat? Or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it sags like a heavy load. Or maybe it explodes. Thank you. <laughs>